Okay, so Daniel Sakala will speak in our seminar today about social contagion modeled on random networks. Yes. Hello, uh, so you already know what I'm talking about. So given the group here, I should probably warn you all, uh, there's going to be no category theory in the next hour long. None. Uh, so that might be good for some of you, really annoying for some of you. I guess we'll just have to deal with it. However, these are some ideas that I would like to eventually start with thinking about using category. Uh, so if you have any ideas, you know, maybe we can talk about that. All right, um, and because a lot of our research is sort of motivated on some level by climate change, I feel like I should spend just a moment to talk about how this sort of fits into the climate change picture. So of course there's a lot of fronts that need addressing when we're talking about climate change, right? So there's scientific fronts, there's engineering technology, there's political and economical, uh, but one thing that we don't talk about so much is the social aspect. Right? So, of course, controlling climate change requires collective action. Um, but that requires convincing a whole lot of people that climate change is bad and needs to be addressed somehow. Right? Uh, and so, to convince lots and lots of people, I mean, there's lots of things to do, but one of them at least is to expose lots and lots of people to this message that climate change is bad. Um, and so, if we can understand somehow the dynamics of social networks, then we can leverage our understanding to help spread this message that climate change is bad. Um, and so here we're just going to overview a very simple model of social contagion. And what I mean when I say social contagion is that uh, it's like a spread of ideas or opinions, beliefs, and so on through social networks. Um, so just to give us like a sort of jumping off point, Social contagion is very similar to biological contagion, right, the spread of disease. Uh, however, there's definitely some important differences. For one, uh, in social, force correlates with exposure. So if I have, if I'm exposed to like a thousand people giving me this message, that's a much stronger force than if just one person. Right? Um, it also spreads many to one. Like, so if there's like a thousand people out there telling me climate change is bad, um, and then all of a sudden I adopt this attitude. It's not necessarily like one of those 1,000 people that I could put my finger into and said, oh, it's you that spread this message to me. So the actual influence itself is sort of dispersed throughout the entire force. Biological contagions, however, uh, the force is independent of exposure. So at the risk of becoming a little bit too ontological, I put is in quotation marks, um, because a lot of models actually treat uh, force is independent of exposure, right? So if, uh, if I'm exposed to like 100 people with the flu, uh, I don't, my rate of contracting the flu isn't necessarily that much greater than if I just meet one of a single person with the flu, right? And also the spread is one to one. So if I catch the flu and I've exposed to 1,000 people, well, I'm really only getting it from a single one of those 1,000 people, right? I might not be able to answer which one, but it's coming from a single source. So already, Biological is well studied, social less so, but we're already seeing sort of differences between something that we know about and then something that we're trying to know. Okay. Um, and so, probably the paper that really, uh, I don't know, really had an impact on social models is this paper by Duncan Watts. And this is really what we're going to be talking about today. So he, produce, he produces this paper, and it was, you can see it's pretty influential. So it's communicated by Murray Jill Mann, who's, you know, no slouch, and uh, currently has quite a few citations. Um, and the basic ingredients for this is what we're going to call a network. And when I say network, I'm really just talking about a simple undirected graph. And then here the nodes of this graph are going to represent like a person, an individual, and the edges will represent friendship. Of course, that can be just relationship or whatever, but we'll call it friendship. Um, and of course, this is a very basic model, and it's since been updated since this is, this is what, 16, seven, 16, 17 years old now? So work keeps going, so other graphs are also considered. But we'll just deal with the simple and directed sort of model here. Okay, and so what motivates this Watts paper? Um, well, he sort of asks this question, like, all right, so let's say we have a network, and it's exposed to like a sort of external force. For instance, consider like the network of Facebook friends. 
And then if Facebook might come in and like, apply this force, which is like a marketing campaign, right? So like advertising for boots or whatever. You know, and some some of the Facebook friends will see this advertisement, but most won't. Um, so why is it that sometimes like a very small external force can have a much larger effect than a much larger force? Right? So it seems kind of counterintuitive in a sentence you would think of the, the massive uh, the massive campaign or the massive marketing campaign will be much more successful than a very small one. Well, it's not necessarily the case. Um, so you can see examples of this. Well, like a small external force can have a larger impact than a larger force. It's stock market volatility, right? Like, like a little piece of news gets in the ears of some investors and things go to hell. Or like a viral video, or like power grid failures. So these are all examples of where you can see examples of a uh, small external force. Um, so, he has two aims, really to explain triggering of cascades. When I use the cascades, I'm really just meaning like a large event affecting many of the nodes. Um, and I'll get into, I'll make that a little bit more formal later, but that's roughly what I mean. Um, so we want to explain the triggering of these cascades in terms of network connectivity, right? So it's kind of like, they say, real estate, location, location, location. Um, so it's about, not about what you are, but how you're connected to everything that's around you. Um, and also these two qualitative observations. So global cascades can be triggered by events that are actually much smaller than its own scale. So uh, we're always talking about relative size. There's no like, raw notion of size that's really important to us. And the fact that these global cascades are relatively rare compared to the total number of shocks that a system receives. Um, so a times the system could maybe absorb all kinds of shocks without really changing its state or changing its behavior or whatever. Um, right? like, it could be thousands and thousands and thousands of marketing campaigns on Facebook and no one buys any of that stuff. Or they buy like just tiny. Um, so why are they rare? Okay, so we'll get to start somewhere. And a good starting point for what's is this idea of binary decisions with externalities. Oh, I guess I can look at this. Um, so a binary decision, you can just think of like, oh, should I do the thing or not? Like, should I adopt this behavior? Should I adopt this idea? Should I buy that boot? Should I do the thing or should I not? Right? So two options. A little bit more formally, we have a set A of agents, right? That'll be like the people on Facebook. Uh, and they all decide to either not do the thing so they're assigned to zero, or they're assigned to do the thing, uh, which is a one. And so agents in, are going to be kind of like the nodes. So agents is much more like, I guess, economist sort of term. Um, so all right, so that's binary decisions. What's externalities? So externalities is all about, uh, well, me, if I'm making a decision, it benefits me to understand what everyone else out there is doing, too. Right? Um, so there's a few examples of why this is true. Uh, one is that maybe I have limited information about something. And so I don't want to spend all this time and effort to go out and collect the information, so I'll just ask my friends. Like, is this restaurant any good? I don't want to, like, or I could go to Yelp, right? Like, what does people on Yelp say? I don't want to have to go in and, like, dig into the background of the chef and all the servers and all this. So I just ask them, or ask people. Uh, another way to incentivize me to go out and collect the information uh, is that maybe I have tons of information and I just don't know how to make sense of it, right? Like, I can know all kinds of things about a company and about maybe a stock, but I don't understand, like, what does all this mean? Like, what, all right, so, like, here's all this information, but I don't know what to do with that, so maybe I'll just ask other people that I respect or who I believe know things, so I'll say, uh, what do you think I should do in this situation? If you're a stockbroker, should I buy this stock? Um, or a third option is that the value of a purchase might actually go up the more that other people have, like fax machines, right? So if I'm the only one with the fax machine, it's basically worthless. But if we all have fax machines, then the value of having a fax machine goes up. So like we're talking about car phones and fax machines. I think we probably should update, <laughs> uh, up, update our examples. Um, so anyway, economists, they call this uh, sort of this, this decision making Binary decisions with externalities. So this is a sort of jumping off point. Um, all right, so we have all these agents, and we have 
relationships between these agents. And so what we're going to do is use random networks to help us model this in a more formal way. So it's true, random networks aren't terribly accurate in terms of how they represent real world situations, but at least they give you somewhere to start, they give you like a tractable thing um, that you can analyze, and then from there you can tweak it and make it better and better. So what is a random network? Uh, that's not something that we ever talk about here, so it's probably worth uh, going through a few models of what a random network is. Right, so really it's just like a random variable, but we're dealing with graphs instead of variables. Right. Um, so here's maybe the most popular model is we just take pick a probability, some number, turn it zero to one, fix a number of agents, which will be like our nodes, and then a random network on n nodes will have n choose two, so that's just like n choose two is to give a complete graph. Um, so each of those edges appear independently with, with the probability that we put. Um, another random network model is we fix uh, a set of nodes, we fix a set of edges, and then we just put a uniform distribution on all the edges that we pick. So we're not starting with a complete graph, we're starting with uh, whatever set of edges we're interested in. And then each of those sort of exist with some probability, like one over cardinality. Okay. Um, what Watts uses, and this isn't actually the name that this model goes by, I'm just using it because this is what Watts is using in this paper. Um, so really, the really important thing for the use here is to control the neighborhoods. I'm going to use the word neighborhoods a lot. And really what I mean is the neighborhood of a node is just all the other nodes that it's going to straightforward. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to fix a probability distribution on the natural numbers. Right, so that means if you sum up like the each natural number is associated with some probability, and of course you add up all those probabilities, you have to get more. Um, so this random network that this kind of we're going to be using is that we start with n nodes and then we're going to choose a node and then that node has let's say k neighbors with probability of pk. P is okay. P is okay, of course, depends on this probability distribution that we start with. Okay. How do you the decide which oh. neighbors it has? Uh, right, so the neighbors that it has is like uniform. So you can like pick. So if something has like K neighbors with probability of P, uh, the neighbors that it has we're picking out with like a, just like a uniform. So everybody has an equally like. Right. The chance of being so probability your friend, friend but we mm -hmm. normalize it in such a way that you yeah. have pi friends. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. K friends. Sorry. K. K friends would probably be a piece of K. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the thing we're going to be using. Um, so what we're going to do, now we're going to start to build towards the actual model. But we're going to start with one of these random networks that I just described. Um, however, in the real world, uh, there's people have like variation. I might have more knowledge than you about something. You might have different preferences or opinions than me, and so on and so forth. And so what we're going to do to try to take that and stick it into our model is start with the probability distribution on the interval, unit interval. And then we're going to define this threshold function on the agents. So to every agent, we're going to give them like a threshold. And that threshold is going to be defined using this probability distribution. Okay. So really, this threshold, together with this random network, is going to be our model. And then the, uh, we'll see how the threshold is used. In that. But just, just uh, imagine a random network where every node has like a real number associated to it, and that real number is manageable. That's good enough. Okay, so I'm just going to define a couple maps just to help me describe things. So we can assign to each node its neighborhood. So to the n is just a fancy way of saying power set. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to recursively define a function on the natural numbers, right? So this, we have n, which is our set of nodes. 
These are going to be obviously like, the two decisions to do or not to do. Um, and then this is going to be like our discrete time. Okay, so we're going to start off initializing everything at zero. So if no one does anything, or no one has done anything yet. Right? Um, and then we're going to perturb that. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick like a very tiny set of nodes relative to the graph overall, and we're going to set them equal to one. So this is just saying, uh, so this again is like analyst speak for really, really, really much smaller than I guess. Um, so really all this, this bit is saying is that like n prime, the set of like initial nodes that we're going to set to one, is like super tiny compared to this the amount of nodes that we have we're starting. Okay, so we're going to perturb it, flick the graph, some of them set to one, uh, and then we have this update rule, where, uh, so if we're at time k, then what we're going to do for any nodes that have done the thing, we're going to not change their state. So the idea here is that like, once you do the thing, you can't undo it. Right, so once you're one, you're one forever. Okay, um, so once you're one, you're one forever. That's what that first bullet says. The second bullet says that, all right, so suppose you haven't done the thing or a time k. So here's kind of where the threshold comes in. So here's the threshold here, the threshold for x. So remember that this threshold is just some number between zero and one inclusive. And then what this is saying is, oh, if the amount of people in your neighborhood have done a thing, like, so this is fractional, right? So this, this numerator is like the total number of people, the total number of friends that have done the thing, and the bottom is just your, your number of friends. So if like the fraction of your friends have done a thing crosses your th threshold, we're gonna switch you to one. Right, so if my threshold for deciding to go uh, see a movie, so let's say one half, and then three quarters of my friends have seen it, then I'll go see it too. Right, that's all it's saying. Um, otherwise, if, if your friends, not enough friends, have done the thing, then you continue to not do it. And this threshold gets to depend on who you are, right? Yes. So this gets to be a pretty, it's like a whole bunch of like a class of models. I mean, you could like do a simple one where mm -hmm. this threshold is the same. Right, yeah. So yeah, you can like start, you start with like a probability distribution on your, uh, um, the zero one, and so like maybe like certain thresholds are way more popular than others. And so this probability distribution that we start with uh, sort of influences how the threshold gets. So yeah, you can like start with a uniform uh, distribution, and so like any threshold is equally likely, or you can start with like collapse it all to like a single thing, and say, oh, the probability of choosing threshold is one half is 100%. Yeah, I guess there's this idea of early adopters, or like people yeah. are more likely to go ahead and do something. So it would be like the one with lower thresholds in this. Model. Yes, it's that, and it has to do with their location. And that's actually exactly the terminology Watts uses. Um, I didn't use that terminology. Okay. I don't want to throw it too much. Okay. Uh -huh. But yeah, that's, that's the idea. Okay, so this is our update. Um, and so, we're gonna basically keep on updating until things stabilize. Okay, um, so let's, so here, this is a binary decision, right? So this is a way to model a bunch of people making a decision. And it's similar to some really well-known models that have already existed, but there's some important differences uh, between this and those, which sort of mean that this new model is actually filling a void. So here's some of those well-known models. So a disease model, right? So how disease spreads, um, but there's an important difference between common models of disease spreading um, in that Watts' model <coughs> introduces this local dependency. So for instance, um, if I am, well, I guess talking about the disease model, like let's say, so I'm close to someone with uh, the flu, then the effect on this me being close to them doesn't really depend on me also being close to other people with the flu. Right? However, the Watts model does, like if I'm close to someone who has gone to you know, uh, Chez Sakala, then the beautiful French Italian restaurant down the street, uh, 
then I probably won't necessarily go, but if like a thousand of my other friends will also go, then I'll be a much smaller group. Right? So that's like the idea of local dependencies. Um, so another thing is this thing called bootstrap percolation. And so here's basically what it is. Um, we start with, uh, well, percolation is basically very similar to what we just said, um, except that the threshold that each node has is just a number. So like, instead of switching when like more than one half of my friends does a thing, I'll like switch if more than 20 of my friends did it. Right? So it's not fractional, it's just like the raw number of people. Right? Um, so that's a big difference between this Watts model and bootstrap percolation, which is not a classical topic. Um, and so the importance of that difference is that with fractional thresholds, it's more like a, it, the more and more friends I have that, have that are activated or set to one, the less and less valuable it is. So, uh, however, if it's raw, then sort of each successive person that does a thing is equally as important as the last. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an important thing. Like, what's the difference if I have like a thousand people who saw the movie versus a thousand people? At that point, like, all right, um, okay, so another important thing is the easing or ising, I'm not sure, you know how to pronounce it? I guess both are views. Yeah, okay. Okay. Both are views. Ising? We'll go with ising. So the ising, the ising model is a thing that uh, comes from statistical mechanics where you have a lattice, basically. A point and each lattice is associated with, with like a spin, like up spin or down spin or whatever, uh, and the spins on this lattice change according to some update rule. Um, but the thing on a lattice is that every single node has the same amount of neighbors. But that's not the case in our Watson model, right? So there are, the neighborhood sizes change depending on what node you are. Um, and so these three features, this local dependency, this fractional threshold, and the last is called heterogeneity, meaning that like, people, the neighborhoods can be different sizes. Uh, so these are central features to the Watts model, and this is what sets them apart from a lot of previous models. Okay, um, and so Watts focuses on, like so his analysis focuses on what's the probability that a global cascade is triggered by a small seed of active nodes in a given particular uh, network, and then once it is triggered, what's how big is it going to be? Um, so I've been using this word global cascade, uh, and I think we all have an you know, idea of what that could look like, right? Like the, uh, eating Tide Pods or whatever, like a lot of people start doing it, but let's try to make it a little bit more precise. For me. So enter percolation theory. Um, so first I want to talk for a moment about finite percolation. Um, so consider a network with only finitely many nodes. And we're going to have like an initial seed, A, that have done the thing that are set to one, um, and then I have some update rule to switch other ones, other nodes to one. Uh, so now let me fix another set of nodes, which I'll call B, and those will be like the final state nodes or whatever. And so we'll say that percolation occurs that if um, once, if after we update enough that all the nodes in B become one. So, uh, so an example, let's say our network Let's say we have like a block of porous material, and then the nodes are like the location of the pores. And then A, the active node, would be like the, the top surface. And so I'd like activate it by pouring a bunch of water on top. And then the pores on the bottom would be my B. And so then percolation would occur if I dumped it on top of this porous material, and the water percolates through and makes it to the bottom. Um, so that's finite percolation. Infinite percolation is now if I have infinitely many nodes. So we'll deal with countable infinity. Every time I say infinite, that's what I mean. Um, and then this, we say percolation occurs if infinitely many nodes are activated. Um, so I think there's like variations on what this is, but this is what I'll do. Uh, and obviously, this is a much easier thing to state. Uh, and in fact, the mathematical analysis sort of bears out, or the mathematics behind infinites. Percolation is much easier than finite percolation, uh, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to deal with a Watts model 
where we actually are dealing with an infinite network of nodes as opposed to a finite network of nodes. Uh, and then we'll say that a global cascade happens once infinitely many of the nodes are set to one. And then some of you may be like, oh, infinite, that doesn't seem very like realistic or computable or whatever. And also, but we'll get to that. Is it countable? I'm sorry? Is it countable infinite? Yeah, I, th I think that's fair to assume. Okay. Might as well stick with that. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do is we'll start with a Watts model. We have our node set, and we have um, this probability on the natural numbers, the probability distribution, and we have some sort of threshold for each node, uh, and the thing is we have to, the only assumption we're gonna make is that uh, we have infinite many nodes. Um, again, uh, so here's, I guess, the statement. Where, so infinite n makes analysis a lot easier for us people working with pen and paper. Uh, however, computer simulations actually are very, quite similar, as long as n is larger than 10,000 nodes more, it's, really has a lot of similar behavior to the infinite case, and so there is some value to this model using infinite. Um, okay, so how does growth happen? Right, so we start with this. We start with this uh, network. We're gonna initiate it, so we're gonna define, sorry, I think I used a little dash here, but we're gonna basically set which nodes, certain nodes to active, at time zero, very small amount of nodes relative to the overall. Um, and then we're gonna choose this term, vulnerable. So node X is vulnerable if it neighbors an active node and has a threshold smaller than one over the degree of the node. So the degree of the node is just how many things it's connected to. Um, right, it's just simple on perfect graph, so it's just like how many turns do you have. Um, and then based on some of the other assumptions that I'm sort of sweeping under the rug here, um, we're kind of assuming things to be sparse, like people don't have too many friends relative to the overall network. Um, and I think, so Watts and Stevens Kurgatz, so I think Stevens Kurgatz, maybe some of you know, in the Cornell, uh, dynamical systems, what's that? How do you, how would you say someone who studies dynamical systems? Dynamicist. A dynamicist? Dynamical <laughs> systems theorist is how I would say. Okay. That's probably the least silly book. Um, <laughs> I can make up one more silly one. I'm sure you could. Um, so, Stephen Tregoss is like a famous uh, dynamic, dynamical systems theorist, uh, and Watts was a student of his. But now Watts is, like, he's in the sociology department at Columbia, uh, among other things, he does some private sector stuff. And so, I had a little bit of trouble reading his stuff because he's not a mathematician. He was, he was kind of vague about a few things. There were definitely like several interpretations of definitions of vulnerable neighbor that I could have considered. But this is the one that I landed on. I'm not 100% sure I'm correct, but this is how I read it. Um, so one thing I was assuming is that like, the network is sparse. I mean, if you don't have too many friends um, relative to the size of the network, and so we can almost assume that the likelihood of me starting out with a friend, or more than one friend who who's starting off initialized is practically nil, right? So basically, we're assuming that as long as our threshold is smaller than this, um, where this would be like, if we're assuming that we can have at most one friend to begin with that is active, then this would be like, the fraction of friends that, have, that are active. All right, so, if you're, if, so if this is bigger than the threshold, or the threshold is smaller than that, um, then of course I'm vulnerable to do the thing myself. Okay, so one assumption we can make, in order for the activation to grow, for the ones to spread across the nodes, there has to be some vulnerable nodes there. There's no way this thing can grow without this, these vulnerable nodes. Right? Us, it depends on vulnerability. And so we make this conjecture that a sufficient condition for a global cascade to occur is to actually look at the, the vulnerable nodes instead of the ones. We're going to look at the vulnerable nodes um, and see if they percolate through the node. Right? So with this conjecture, we've kind of changed the problem. 
We're not studying a dynamics problem on a graph. We're studying a percolation problem, which is a lot easier to do. Okay, so now let's start the analysis. So here's just a refresher on what sort of ingredients we're playing around with. So we have this probability distribution on the natural numbers. Uh, we have a probability distribution that helps us define our threshold and then the threshold itself. So really, don't worry about this this f really just, we have a threshold function um, so that each node has some function associated to it. Um, so here are some facts. So given a random node x, the probability that it has k friends is p to the k, right? So that just defines, because we're defining our random network to be there, right? So there's no, there's no real content there. Um, so what's the probability that it's vulnerable so we're going to call this thing rho, the probability that it's vulnerable. Um, and so really it's just the probability that your threshold is less than 1 over the degree. Right? And so of course, probability, we define things by integrating. So we can compute our probabilities. Um, so the probability that a thing is vulnerable, a node is vulnerable, we're calling it rho sub uh, degree x. So where degree x is, um, well, I guess it'll make more sense. The slope group will make more sense in a second. So here it is. So the probability that the node is both vulnerable and has degree k is just the product of the two. We're assuming we're not dependent. So, right, so we have rho sub k, where k is a probability that a node of degree k is vulnerable, and then p sub k is just the node has k friends. So we have this. So now, um, here is where maybe people's experience with probability theory might start diverging. We start talking about probability generating functions. Um, so probability generating functions is basically a form of power series. It contains a lot of information about the probability distribution. Right. Um, right, you can take various derivatives of it to get various measures. Um, and then uh, so I don't want to get too deep into it because I kind of explain what you need to know as I go along. So here we have a probability generating function for the degree of a vulnerable node. Right, so this is only considering degrees of vulnerable nodes. So you can see that I have, I'm basically defining what I'm calling g sub naught. Um, it's a formal power series where z is like our indeterminate. Our coefficients are the probability that a degree j node is vulnerable and has degree j. Uh, I think I said something. Um, probability a node has degree j and is vulnerable. That's what it is. Um, so we can evaluate this at 1. And really, to be like a little bit more careful, you're really taking the limit as we approach 1 from below. Um, that's what that little subscript negative sign means, but whatever. We're, just, we're evaluating at 1. So, when you stick one into here, for z, uh, you get the total fraction of nodes in your network that are one. And when you take the first derivative of it, the formal derivative, then you get the average degree of the vulnerable nodes. Because you can see really what's happening here is we'll be dropping this j down there, uh, so we're really going to have j times the probability that it's vulnerable, times the probability that we have degree j, so we're kind of just taking an average. Um, so, like again, this is like a, prop, a really nice property of uh, generating functions: the fact that you can take the first derivative and you get this nice measure. I get this nice piece of information. Okay, so we're interested in cascade propagating from an active node, like a vulnerable node, around it, um, or a random node around it. Um, and so, one thing we can assume is that the larger my degree is, the more likely I am to actually be friends with someone, an active uh, node. Like the more friends I have, the more likely I am to be friends with a sick person. Um, and so we're going to find another moment generating function um, where it's going to be normalized. So up top, you see we have, this is basically counting the, the average, the mean of the node, sorry, the mean degree size of vulnerable nodes. And here, we're normalizing it by 
the average number of notes. The average degree, sorry. The average degree of notes. Um, and so this is kind of like more a nicer way to think of it, right? So G prime divided by the average. Number. So it's like the average number of friends people have got divided by, sorry, the average number of sick friends people have divided by the average number of friends. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so this is, so uh, normalized moment generating functions are nice because you get things like skew and kurtosis and all of this home probability stuff. Kurtosis is like the measure of like how fat the tails are, how fat the end of the distribution. Um, the skewiness is like how lopsided it is. Okay, so I'm going to hand legally define clusters to be this particular highly connected things. What is highly connected? I'm going to hand wave that away. So, stop asking all kinds of questions. Um, all right, so we're interested in the behavior of clusters of vulnerable nodes, right? Not just like nodes that are sort of individually vulnerable, but like actual nodes that are vulnerable and like sort of stuck together somehow. Um, and so, to calculate properties of such clusters, we're going to define these new generating functions where on this one, we're going to take Q to be the probability that randomly chosen nodes belongs to a vulnerable cluster of size of J. And so this is uh, something that's computable. And similarly for H1, we're going to, it's going to be similar like G1, where it's going to be now the probability, we're going to be summing over the probability that a neighbor of an initially active node belongs to a vulnerable cluster of size J. So, knowing that or understanding that is not too important. So I'm just going to sort of like keep moving forward, but just know that these are two things that I'm going to use uh, in a second. But you don't need to like understand it to know how it's used. Okay, so these are equations that can be shown to hold if you do some work. Um, right. So again, yeah, I'm not going to understand these equations too much, but just the, for the sake of, let's try to at least engage with them a little bit. Um, the first term, this one minus thing, is a probability that a node is not vulnerable. And the second term sort of accounts, you know, like the size distribution of vulnerable clusters attached to another vulnerable node. Right, so like imagine like a highly connected cluster of nodes, and then like one, there's like one node that's vulnerable out here that's connected. It's not highly connected, but it's like connected just a little bit. So like how do these things change size throughout our network? Right, so that's what the second term is sort of accounting for. Um, okay, so using all these equations, these are the four that I just sort of laid out, G naught, G1, H1, and H naught. I don't know why I switched the order, but whatever. Um, you can like do a bunch of arithmetic. Bunch of substitution, blah, 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 and you get this equation here. And this is the average vulnerable cluster size. All right, so remember, H naught, I'm sorry, I hate when this happens, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so remember, H naught is about um, cluster sizes for vulnerable nodes. Then, when we take the prime of a generating function, that gives us averages, average sizes. And so what this equation means uh, is the average vulnerable cluster size. And the beautiful thing about this is that we can see when it diverges. And the whole point of this is that conjecture that I stated a while ago, that change a problem from dynamics to a percolation problem, where all we care about is that is when vulnerable nodes percolate the network. And like that will be enough, that'll be sufficient for us to say that a global cascade happens. So here we actually get an equation to see, oh, the, to see that uh, the average vulnerable cluster size when it diverges, right? when this denominator goes to zero. Okay, so that is when this thing equals that. Okay, so how do we interpret this? So, um, so I'm gonna, I like to interpret it uh, that thi as this is a function in like this summation, so I'm going to consider this thing like the variable. So when you do that, what you're getting is a hyperbola that's sort of shifted up one, 
and then it shifted either left or right, depending on what's going on here. Um, and so if, let's say, our, our variable, let's, you can like forget that this means the average degree size, but we'll just consider it a variable. Um, if this is less than this quantity here, then the average size of a vulnerable cluster is infinite. Right? It says, you can imagine this is like, go back to pre-calculus, we did a graph and we shift it up and down, you know, different things. Well, then we're actually shifting this hyperbola uh, kind of like up, up this amount, and then over by this amount. To, oh, when I say over, because that's kind of over to the right. Um, and so we have this explosion happening in the positive, um, positive region. Um, and so that's how we can think of uh, the vulnerable cluster blowing up. However, if it's smaller, sorry, if it's greater, then we're actually sort of like shifting this hyperbola thing. Hyperbola? Yeah, hyperbola to the left. And so that the explosion is happening in the negative side of the plane, the left side of the plane, and so it's like, since this is supposed to model like real life stuff, we don't care about negative things like that. Um, and so, actually what's going on is that the average size of a vulnerable cluster is so small, and the clusters are so, are likely far apart. Of course, speaking probabilistically, they're likely far apart, and so they probably don't influence each other very much, and so actual global cascade is very unlikely in that case. Mm -hmm. um, finite time. I'm sorry? In finite, everything's in Everything's in like finite, finite time, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, like I said before, this whole Watts model thing is based on having infinitely many nodes. Um, and computers, they don't deal too well with infinities. Um, but Watts, this is something I'm going to not talk about, but Watts goes on to talk about actually doing a bunch of simulations. And you can graph the actual. Um, the, you, can, you can graph the sort of things you're dealing with in the infinite case, and then you can run the simulations with a large number of nodes, and there is a very close correlation, and so the infinite case is actually beneficial to help understand um, regulation and global cascades, and so actually it can make testable predictions of real life scenarios. And I will end here. Tell your mathematician because he didn't show a single graph. If you were, mm -hmm. oh. if you were a, yeah. a scientist, you'd be like showing all sorts of graphs of simulations of these things, mm -hmm. like maybe bar or someone else's paper. Or something. Yeah, Watts does that. Yeah, um, I can hold them up. I have the paper here. I don't know if that's silly, but yeah, here's some simulations. Um, because I think a lot of people would, would like to see it. So there's like solid lines. I guess this one at the top is probably the most interesting where the dashed line deals with the infinite case and then the little dots are simulations. So are these clusters like um, uh, total, I mean, perfect graphs? I mean, they're all, everybody's connected to everybody else. Um, yeah. I, Almost um, everybody else. Yeah, so I was hand waving that away because I'm not really sure the answer. Okay. Um, Presumably they're highly connected with each other and, yeah. and not so much with anybody else. Yeah, so they didn't like really dig so, into what so they have kind of close to kind of a semi independent existence. But that's yeah, kind of that was my take on it too, like based on a little bit of context and a little bit of extra uh, research I did seeing how other people use the term cluster. I couldn't find like a solid definition. This is what clustering means, and this is what it always means, and how everyone uses it. Yeah. So, um, so my guess is like everyone is like highly connected. Maybe they're lightly connected to outside things. Maybe they're fully connected, like they're like little little complete graphs, like inside the graph. Small world networks. Yes. Um. Well, that's another Steven Stragatz thing. Um, is he the one who came up with that? Yeah. That's yeah, super famous. I mean, now I know why he's famous. Yeah. He came up with that. Um, and that is actually another random graph model. Um, where 
where you don't say, like, oh, your things are connected, or there's edges with this probability. You say it's a graph with the small world network, the small world uh, property, which is something like, oh, there's only, I don't know exactly what it's called. Six degrees of separation. That has something to do with the appearance of these, what, something that look like clusters. Mm -hmm. we, they're not already there, they kind of appear in the dynamics. Yeah, I think you add on some of these models where you keep adding on new edges. Mm -hmm. Probably like the people who are connected to the most people already are the most likely to get new edges mm -hmm. like, attached to them. Right. And then the small world property is I guess that like you can pick two random nodes, you can get a path from one to the other that's not very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this was experimentally verified. I forget who did it. Was it Mil Milton? Or was it a psychologist? They actually did it like, oh, you give someone a letter and it's addressed to someone. And you, no, he's like, you give this to someone who you think is most likely to be able to get this to the right person. And they did this with actually quite a lot of success. Um, showing like, oh, it only passed through a few, I think it was like six or seven line average uh, iterations. And then Watts again did it uh, through with emails recently in the last two decades or so. Why did you get interested in this paper? Um, I don't. Know, I, I I guess because I'm thinking about uh, applications, and I'm not like I don't like chemistry. I'm not like mm -hmm. physics. I'm like I could take it or leave it. Um, so like I like sociology a lot, more. and. Like it's good to say what you like in science, not what you don't like. <laughs> you make no enemies by saying you like. <laughs> okay, so I like sociology. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to try to dig in here for some cool applications. Um, so that brought me to this. Edit that. Mm -hmm. um, did Watts talk at all about how, given a certain um, definition of activation, in practice, uh, how you would go about estimating the threshold function? Would it just be like through taking some statistical surveys about how people decide to start doing something based on? Yeah, probably. Um, like he's more going top down, I think. Like he's starting with the theory of models and like taking some assumptions and Maybe, oh, this should be a good for modeling or life thing. In terms of going the other way up, sort of bootstrapping up, yep. how to actually construct one a threshold function in practice, yeah, I guess that would make sense. Like you would just do a lot of surveys and polling. Have people used the framework yet? For um, I'm not sure to what extent it's been used and experimentally verified. Um, this topic seems to be extremely popular, mm -hmm. and so probably Facebook has like a division of people who are experts on like trying to figure out activation thresholds from experimental data, so that you can like know how many people you have to bombard to make a camp something go viral. Yeah, you know, there's just a lot of interest in this stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. and there's so many papers on it that it, it's it's quite a job to catch up. Yeah. So I imagine this paper's probably been, well you said it had like two thousand three hundred mm -hmm. yeah. citations or something like That's that. That's from the Google Scholar. Yeah, so and they're, like, they're, they're probably at least a thousand papers that have developed it. Yeah. Correct. And I think there's another one that he and Strogatz wrote in nature that got like over thirty eight thousand citations or something like that. I was like similar to this. <laughs> So Seems like they've mastered their own. Yeah, it's either yeah, exactly. <laughs> their own network. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's very meta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how do you think this could be augmented to be more specifically uh, useful for climate change activism? Um, well, you're going to need to collect some polling data that I'm sure politicians have because into what their constituents care about. Um, and so you kind of see, like, oh, who's more likely to care about climate change? Who's like kind of on the fence? Who's like categorically opposed? Mm -hmm. And you sort of collect a lot of data and you build a network and you analyze some of these 
models, and then if you get a good sense of who, who are these vulnerable nodes, then so you can target them. Because you only have like monolithic resources, so really you have to sort of focus on um, yeah, like the, the important things. That's kind of like so I was watching an interview with I forget who it was, but it was the chairman of the Fed under Obama, and they were talking about like his strategy for giving out all this money during the 2008 crisis. It's like, all right, so why aren't you giving to like a thousand more grassroots things and have a couple of them you can't do that? Because you gotta find out like who really is making the money dispersed throughout the network, throughout these financial networks. You find out like, who really, um, you gotta track it through, and so like, who would be the most effective people to give through this. And it turns out that it's effects and things like this. So I'll do it somewhere. With, I guess, uh, people with climate change, or not really climate change banks are. So. Do you already have ideas how category you? Um, not specific to this model, really. My thing I'd like to get into soon is there's all of these sort of measures on graphs, like centrality measures, like how oh, is it not connected to other things? There's like how central is it? Um, it's like a lot of these things that network theorists like to use, and I want to try to see if that works with open graphs, using a post band technology, uh, and seeing if some of these things are tutorial. You know, like, uh, yeah, there should be a bunch of quantities about graphs that are easy to calculate or at least approximate by knowing the values of the quantities on the some graphs that you're sticking yeah. together. Mm -hmm. And it could be a sort of mix of category theory and uh, analysis or estimation, because very often I think there will be quantities that you can't exactly calculate right. them compositionally, but you can approximate them compositionally. Mm -hmm. that, I, mean, I suspect that a lot of things in real life are of this sort of uh, rough and ready kind of quality that they're using. Mm -hmm. And that, that category theorists are not so good at that. I mean, they're, they're beginning to try to get good at that, but they're trying, trying to deal with approximate things. Like people have begun to discuss like approximately functorial things and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that would be really interesting to study. I think it's one of Jamie Ficker's students just doing something. So when I went to QPL, he was talking about something like this. David Rutter, his name is. Uh -huh. uh, I can believe that. Yeah, some people have been whispering in my ear about <laughs> approximately approximate functors and things like that. Yeah. Okay. I guess also Tobias Fritz was like talking about epsilon functors, things that are functorial within epsilon. Yeah. Yeah, super cool. Or maybe some of the stuff I'm on are like on type theories. No, use like these uh, modalities somehow to get like, more approximate versions of things. But that's like within like, Topo, so I don't know if you can apply like, like, like maybe that might be a way. Like from like so a lot of, to give an example, like you can't in homotopo type theory everything has to be continuous. So if you're like proving the Brouwer fixed point theorem, you you can you can't prove that in homotopy type theory directly because the map that sends like the point on the interior circle to its like, outside point isn't it's not a continuous thing. So homotopy type theory doesn't do non-continuous things and so it's like actually almost like using modalities to be able to do these sort of things like, approximately continuous. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can yeah. take some of those ideas. I mean pre sheaves homotopos and they assign data to spaces and you could start off with a pre sheet that has some naive assignment of data and use some kind of modalities to work toward their approximation. Yeah. One interesting thing about all this stuff is that there are these uh, somewhat shady companies like Cambridge Analytica who, who have a lot of I think have a lot of mathematicians and so on. And they evolved with them who are trying 
whose job is to try to influence the outcome of political you know, of elections by by you know seeding networks with, with propaganda you know, of various sorts. So one question that I have no idea what the answer to is, is are there any techniques for manipulating networks that can only be used for good? Yeah. <laughs> is there any technology that can only be used for good? Well, that's what you generalize the heck out of your question. One edge knife. <laughs> a what? A one edge knife. A one edge knife, yeah. So, so like, or are we in the situation where, like, you know, you think of some great new method to, like, estimate how many people's friends you need to persuade, persuade a person, uh, and you think you're you're being so great because you're using it to spread the message of climate change, but then you make the mistake of like writing a paper about it, and then it gets used for something you don't out. like. Yeah. Or are there? So the, the question is. is is there any objective uh, notion of like what a true rumor is, as opposed to like a fake rumor, or, or you know, a true a spread of actual facts rather than a spread of propaganda? And is there any way to like adjust networks? I think there probably is. Are ways to maybe like to reshape how networks work to make it easier for 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 true information to spread and harder for. For yeah. fake rumors to spread, mm -hmm. just but the, what? Sorry, no, I anyway, But you can see it's a really hard problem. But but otherwise, if we don't ever tackle that problem, it's sort of like a it's sort of like an endless uh, race of the good guy, quote good guys against the bad guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, so well, naively, we're just introducing a lot more good guys. What? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. naively, we're just introducing a lot more measures on that. Somehow measure truth. Somehow measure. They, they've done stu they've done studies about how about how. I mean, people who have like a pre-existing notion of what's true and what and what's false have done studies about how how true information has a different way of spreading on the network than, mm -hmm. than false information. Um, and so you might in fact be able to sort of operation. Does that have something to do with true that way? something to do with true information is is objected to less often than false information? Um, oh, I, I forget some of the details, but I have a feeling that that false information often spreads by means of you just um like on social networks you just read a some the equivalent of like a headline, a very short, mm -hmm. a very short claim. And you don't bother to click through and to analyze the validity of it, and you just retweet it. It's like some claim. It's like so outrageous that you instantly feel like retweeting it to your to your friends. Whereas true information is actually a little <laughs> it does, le less less gr less grabs you that way. Mm -hmm. You'd be more likely to actually read read about it and, and discuss it and discuss it. Yeah. So. Well, hopefully we use these kind of ideas to make networks where reputability and, or credibility becomes more and more explicit mm -hmm. as you as you record verifications of mm -hmm. the sources are not just nodes but they become types with a lot of information about their their trustworthiness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the kind that's the kind of so that's that's the kind of big data bank of truth and verified. Yeah. Information yeah. somehow. And Google is trying to do that for you know for its uh, for its Google searches. So they, they have ways of trying to reach users. But they're they're constantly trying to improve to make it less likely that if you ask a question that you get a, get bogus answers. So it's not a, it's not a hopeless not a hopeless thing. And of course in the old days you know. Or the idea of scientific publications that you're trying to sp spread truth rather than and flashy rumors. So I think it's really important, but we have to sort of be a bit careful about just like looking for some kind of magic bullet of like what's the best possible way to spread <laughs> to spread some uh, habit or activity uh, because that that's a very double-edged sword. Yeah, for sure.
But yeah, harnessing how to make something go viral is important for this the only game. good viruses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. That's it. Yeah, truth requires, I guess, a lot more. <laughs> Which, you know, a lot of there's assumptions about this model that entails that, or that captures the notion of things taking more, like, the sparseness of the networks. That's really big. Because the relationships takes a lot of effort and work. So, so you can sort of assume uh, this one over the degree of X thing that I kept talking about, that's come, that follows from the sparseness of the Interesting things don't spread as quickly. Don't go viral. Slow. So maybe like the idea is to try to avoid these cascading effects. Mm -hmm. Like cascades take longer, maybe. Yeah, maybe avoid rapid, rapid cascading. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's more. Maybe the shape of the cascade would be different. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to take, you need to have a model that takes into account the fact that lies. Sure, they might spread quickly, but then they go away after a short period of time because they weren't true. And then if the, something true comes along, it might spread more slowly, but it will stay. If I get a human body, if like your bubbles are all over the place, you find that thing is unhealthy. Yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe you want a more calm change in conditions. That's true. Because actually, like, so one thing that I said here is that like, once you're activated, once you're uh, one, you're one forever, mm -hmm. but later models, you can go back to zero. I haven't talked about it. But I think that would be probably more appropriate for something like a truth. Mm -hmm. It could be, you probably go through some iterations. Yeah, for sure, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. There must be some model where reputations, yes. So it's built into them. Yeah. Like yeah. Each agent has a reputation that gets also updated. I guess what well, Google does reputation like how many links to it, I think. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the first, that's the simplest. Yeah, 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 but that's. I was thinking of the one. Yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, by itself. But well, some of it's like, how many links are you have to you from people who have a lot of links to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're trying to get more recruits. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah.